On the University of California campus at Berkeley, there was beginning a phase of this youth revolt that was to be heard around the world. It became, in its simplest form, a fight about freedom of speech. But as almost everyone knows, it was much more than that. The university sought to impose upon the students a series of regulations on political activity and the solicitation of funds that the students felt to be in violation of their constitutional rights. On September 30th, 1964, 300 students staged a 12-hour sit-in at Sproul Hall on the Berkeley campus. That was the beginning of the free speech movement. Eight students were suspended, including a young man who was to become the movement's leader, Mario Savio. More than a demand for free speech was involved. It has been called a powerful moral drive on the part of the students, a drive born of a determination to restore forsaken standards of human conduct to a cynical society. The free speech fight at the University of California developed simply and logically during the fall of 1964 into a revolt against the machine-like impersonality of the multiversity. It became a cry against the alienation of the individual. It became a demand for the return of the human element to education. It became a revolt against the IBM card. On November 5th, the FSM sympathizers resumed picketing of Sproul Hall seat of the university administration. As November drew to a close, the rallies grew larger and the dispute came to focus upon the university's contention that it had the right to punish students for off-campus violations of law that, in the university's opinion, resulted from on-campus advocacy. This became known as the double jeopardy issue. Disciplinary action was taken against Savio and other SFM leaders. FSM asked that charges be dropped. The university ignored the request. This produced on December 2nd, the largest of all the free speech demonstrations up to that time. 6,000 participated. Singer Joan Bias was there. Into Sproul Hall they marched to begin their sit-in. The Sproul Hall sit-in was, even its critics will admit, a triumph of organization and discipline. It had its communications, its lines of supply. The sit-ins conducted classes, held discussions, showed movies. Then the establishment pushed the panic button. An assistant district attorney from Alameda County informed Governor Edmund G. Brown by telephone that the situation was out of control, a contention that is going to remain debatable for some time to come. The governor authorized the use of state highway patrolmen to clear the building. Police from neighboring communities and from the Alameda County Sheriff's Office were massed as they had been in October. Only this time, they were used. Governor Brown's authorization for police action resulted in what is believed to be the greatest mass arrest on a civil liberties issue in the history of the United States. In the ensuing hours, a total of almost 800 demonstrators were arrested and hauled off to various jails. The charges against the students, trespassing, unlawful assembly, resisting arrest. The method of the demonstrators was disciplined nonviolence. From the tip of San Diego to the top of Berkeley's hills, we have built a mighty factory to impart our social skills. Social engineering triumph, managers of every kind.
Let us all with drills and homework manufacture human minds. Make the students safe for knowledge. Keep them loyal. Keep them clean. This is what... On Friday, December 4th, there was a student strike. At least 9,000 students, by conservative estimate, stayed away from classes. Savio and other FSM leaders came back from Santa Rita prison farm and other places of incarceration to be hailed as heroes. Within 24 hours, one of the most distinguished university faculties in the world had raised more than $8,000 in bail money to ensure the release of the jailed demonstrators. No longer was the dispute simply between the FSM and the administration. On December 8th, the Berkeley Division of the University's Academic Senate voted 824 to 115 in favor of a statement that put the faculty solidly behind the students. As the new year came, the issue had not been finally resolved, nor had the fate of the arrested students been determined. Their cases were still pending in court despite widespread calls for amnesty. The dispute had focused unprecedented public interest on the Board of Regents and the vast power it holds over the university. The interlocking connections between the members of the Board of Regents and the economic power structure of the state became a matter of public concern. 